Chapter 9. The Quest A clear summary of the preceding chapters, together with an introduction to this one, is given by the sage in the following. Where the ego rises not, there we are that. But how can that perfect egolessness be attained if the mind dives not into its source? And if the ego dies not, how can our natural state be one? wherein we are that. The source of the mind, that from which the mind takes its rise, which is here indicated, is the heart, which, as we have seen before, is to be tentatively regarded as the own abode of the self. Of course, the absolute truth is that the self is itself, the real heart. Here the sage refers to the egoless state as our natural state, because there we are what we really are, namely the pure consciousness. That the ego must be got rid of is the one thing on which, as the sage tells us, all religions are agreed. They differ only in regard to the nature of the state of deliverance. Once a question was put to the sage, which of the two views is correct, the one that says that God and the soul are one or the opposite one? The sage said, Get to business on the agreed point, namely that the ego must be got rid of. Hence the essential teaching is that which tells us how to get rid of the ego. All else is of less importance. For what we shall do to win egolessness is far more important than the beliefs, if any, we shall cherish about it or about the world that keeps us from it. The methods inculcated by the diverse religions for deliverance are all of them right in a way, but the direct method is the one taught by the sage. The other methods just prepare the mind for the right method. They can do no more. The sage explained it thus, The ego cannot be subjugated by one that takes it to be real. It is just like one's own shadow. Imagine a man who does not know the truth of his shadow. He sees it following him persistently and wants to get rid of it. He tries to run away from it, but it still follows him. He digs a deep pit and tries to bury it, filling up the pit. But the shadow comes to the top and again follows him. He can get rid of it only by looking away from it at himself, the original of the shadow. Then the shadow will not worry him. The seekers of deliverance are like the man in this parable. They fail to see that the ego is but a shadow of the self. What they have to do is to turn away from it towards the self, of which it is the shadow. The first thing to do before beginning the quest is to analyze the ego sense and separate the real from the unreal part of it. We have seen already that the ego has an element of reality mixed up in it, namely the light of consciousness, manifest as I am. This I am we know is real, because it is the part that is constant and unchanging. We need to reject the unreal part, the sheaths or bodies, and take the remainder, the pure I am. This I am is a clue to the finding of the real self. By holding on to this clue, the sage tells us we can surely find the self. He once compared the seeker of the self to a dog seeking his master, from whom he had been parted. The dog has something to guide him, namely the master's scent. By following the scent, leaving everything else, he ultimately finds his master. The I am in the ego's sense is just like the master's scent for the dog. It is the only clue the seeker has for finding the self. But it is an infallible clue. He must get and keep hold of it, fix his mind on it to the exclusion of all other things. It will then surely take his mind to the self, the source of the I am. The analysis is like the following. I am not the gross body because when I dream another body takes its place. Neither am I the mind, because in deep sleep I continue to exist, though the mind ceases to be. And I remember, on waking, the two features of sleep. 
namely the positive one of pure happiness and the negative one of not seeing the world. As mind and body appear fitfully, they are unreal. As I exist continuously, I am real, as the pure I am. I can reject these as not myself, because they are objects seen by me. I cannot reject this I am, because it is that from which body and mind are rejected. Hence, the I am is the truth of me. All else is not I. We do not thus arrive at the practical experience of the I am. What we gain by this analysis is just an intellectual grasp of the truth of the self. The self, thus known, is a mere mental abstraction. What we need to experience is the concrete presence of the self. We have seen in the last chapter that to do this, we need to break the vicious circle of the three states. The method by which this vicious circle can be broken is the quest of the self taught by the sage. We may presume that this was the method followed by the sages of the past. In one place, in the Upanishadic lore, we are told that the self must be sought. It appears that the method followed by Gautama Buddha was this, but somehow the secret of this method seems to have been lost. For what we find in the books is not this method, but something else, which we shall call the traditional method, we shall first study this latter. This method is as follows. First, the seeker learns the truth of the self as given out in the ancient lore called the Upanishads. These and other books take the disciple through the philosophical inquiries set forth in the foregoing chapters. The self is shown to be not this and not this, and so on eliminating at each step some one thing that has been taken to be the self. In this way the gross body, the vital principle, the mind, and the ego are rejected, or we are taken through the three states of being, and the cells that are experienced in them are shown to be not the self in his natural greatness. What remains over after all these are rejected, we are told, is the real self as well as the Supreme Being, the hypothetical cause and sustenance of all the worlds. We are further told that this great being is really unrelated, absolute, formless, nameless, timeless, spaceless, alone without a second, unchanging and unchangeable, perfect, the principle of happiness, which filters down into this world and is the cause of all the enjoyment in it. The next step is for the disciple to reflect on this teaching, especially on the identity of the real self and the great being spoken of, to consider the evidence for and against it. In doing so, he is to remember that the sacred lore is the only evidence he can have of the truth of the real self, which is super central and therefore beyond the intellect. The sacred lore is, of course, authoritative because it embodies the testimony of sages that have found the truth. He is told to employ logic, not for discrediting that testimony, but for accepting it. For logic is by itself barren and can be used either way, according to the predilections of its user. It can lead to no final conclusion of its own. By this reflection he is to arrive at the conclusion that the sacred teaching is correct, that really the Supreme Being is his innermost real self, and he is to repeat this process until he gets firmly convinced that the truth of the self is expressed in the sentence, I am that. The third and last stage of the method is meditation on this teaching. He is to fix his mind on the thought, I am that, to the exclusion of all other thoughts, until he attains perfect concentration on that thought, and his mind begins to flow in a steady current of meditation on that thought. The book tells us that if and when this happens, the real self will reveal itself, and 
ignorance and bondage will cease once for all. This is the threefold method as taught in the textbooks. The sage of Arunachala allows that this threefold method has its use. He says it is a good method for purifying and strengthening the mind, so that it may become a fit instrument for the quest that is taught by himself. For the strength of the mind consists in its freedom from distraction by the multiplicity of thoughts that usually arise and dissipate its energies. And it is unquestionable that only a strong mind can reach the goal, never a weak one, so says the ancient lore as well as the sage of Arunachala. He says, The direct method of winning the real self is diving into the heart, seeking the source of the I am. The meditation, I am not this, I am that, is of course helpful, but it is not itself the method of finding the self. Speaking to a visitor, he said, You are told that the ego is not your real self. If you accept it, then you have only to search for and find that which is your real self, the real being of which the ego is a false appearance. Why then do you meditate, I am that? That only gives a fresh lease of life to the ego. It is like someone trying to avoid thinking of the monkey when taking medicine. By the very act of trying, he admits the thought, the source or truth of the ego must be traced and found. Meditating I am that is of no use, for meditation is by the mind and the self is beyond the mind. In the quest of its own reality, the ego perishes of itself. Hence, this is the direct method. And all else the ego is retained, and hence so many doubts arise, and the eternal question remains to be faced. Until that question is faced, there will be no end to the ego. Then why not face that question at once, without going through those other methods? Whatever assumes the reality of the ego, whether explicitly or by implication, would even take us further away from the goal, the egoless state, if we do not beware. The sage criticizes this method as follows. If one goes on meditating, I am not this, I am that, instead of winning the natural state, which is indicated by the Upanishadic text, thou art that, by pursuing with one pointed mind the quest, who am I? It is due to mere weakness of mind, for that reality is ever shining as the self. Here it is pointed out that the Upanishadic text, thou art that, tells us The fact that the self experienced in the egoless state is the supreme reality. It therefore means that we should win the egoless state by proper method. It does not tell us to meditate, I am that. From the text we must understand that by a single effort we shall win two seemingly different things, namely the self and the supreme being because both are one and the same. The quest of the real self consists in gathering together all the energies of the body and mind by banishing all alien thoughts and then directing all those energies into a single current, namely the resolve to find the answer to the question, Who am I? The question may also take the form of Whence am I? Who am I means what is the truth of me. Whence am I means what is the source of the sense of self in the ego. The source in this quest is to be understood not as some remote ancestor or progenitor in evolution, nor as some being existing before the birth of the body, but as a present source. Someone who seemed to think that it was important to know about his own previous births asked the sage how he could get to know of them. The sage answered, Why bother about previous births? Find out first if now you have been born. In this as in other idle questions, the ego lurks and manages to sidestep the search for the truth. Really, the self 
was never born. So the source is to be sought not in the past, but in the present. This quest is the one sure method of breaking the vicious circle of the three states, for it not only quietens the thinking mind, but prevents it from falling asleep and thereby losing all consciousness. Therefore, it has been described as sleeping watchfully. Neither in ordinary waking, when the mind wanders from thought to thought, nor in sleep, when even the basic consciousness of I am is submerged, can that vicious circle be overpassed. But for an instant of time, in the passage of the mind from the vagrancy of waking to the utter stillness of sleep, the consciousness attains its purity as the formless I am. By the force of the resolve in this quest, the consciousness is reduced to and kept steadily in this formless state. And by this, the vicious circle is broken and the egoless state is one. The sage describes the method of the quest in the following. Just as one dives into a lake, seeking a thing that has fallen in, so should the seeker dive into the heart, resolved to find where from rises the ego sense, restraining speech and the vital breath. This brings out the devotional aspect of the quest. As the diver devotes himself to his purpose, the recovery of the lost article, by restraining the breath and diving with all his weight, so too the seeker must be devoted to the finding of the real self, the source of the I am in the ego, by the ingathering of all the vital and mental energies and directing them heartwards. The resolve to find the self is the dynamic element in the quest, without which there can be no diving into the heart. The question, who am I, or whence am I, implies this resolve. To him that so dives, says the sage, success is assured. For then, says he, some mysterious force arises from within and takes possession of his mind and takes it straight to the heart. If the seeker be pure of mind and free from love of individuality, he would yield himself unreservedly to this force and get the highest of all rewards. For whatever a man is devoted to, that he gets, and there is nothing higher than the real self. He that has not this perfect devotion will need to practice the quest repeatedly till the mind becomes pure and strong or to practice some kind of meditation or devotion to God. Devotion implies renunciation, which means non-attachment to the unreal. So we are taught by the sages, he that is greatly devoted to any one thing is so far indifferent to other things. He that is devoted to the self that is inside is so far indifferent to the world that is outside. Devotion and renunciation are like the two sides of a single metal. They are inseparable. Renunciation strengthens the mind and ensures success in the quest. This we know from common worldly experience. Whoever is devoted to any worldly end renounces of his own accord. Whatever stands in the way and gains his end. Naturally, renunciation is equally necessary for the winning of the greatest of all gains, the egoless state. But we must see to it that we understand renunciation aright. It is a purification of the mind, a harmonious and concentrated direction of the mind to the goal, not simply the observance of external forms of self-denial. We are told that speech and the vital breath should be restrained. But the sage explains that the breath does not need to be actively restrained if the resolve be keen and persistent, for then the breath would automatically be suspended and the energies hitherto operating the body indrawn and reunited to the mind, thus enabling it to dive into the heart. This ingathering of the vital energies is essential for so long as these energies are united to the body, the mind cannot turn away from the body 
and from the body and the world and dive into the heart. When the breathing ceases by the force of the resolve, the mind is no longer aware of the body or the world. The body then becomes almost a corpse. If the seeker has not the needful strength of devotion so that the breathing does not stop of itself, he is advised to bring about suspension of the breath by the simple method of watching the breathing process. When this watch is steadily kept up, the breath slows down and finally stops. Then the mind becomes quiet, free from distracting thoughts, and can then be devoted to the quest. As in meditation of any sort, so in the pursuit of this quest, thoughts of surprising variety may arise and distract the mind, and a sense of defeat and discouragement may be felt. The sage tells us that these thoughts arise only to be quelled, and hence there is no need for the seeker of the self to be disheartened, to accept defeat. If it seems that success cannot come in the near future, that it could come only after long delay, he should meet the thought by remembering that time itself is not real and that the self is not in time. In a book of great antiquity, it is stated that the seeker of the real self must have as much perseverance and patience as is involved in attempting to dry up the ocean by removing water from it drop by drop. In another book, there is a parable of a pair of sparrows whose eggs were washed away by the sea. The birds determined to recover the eggs and punish the sea at the same time by drying it up. This they proceeded to do by repeatedly plunging into the waters and shedding the clinging drops on the shore. The fable says that finally the gods intervened and the eggs were restored. Every alien thought that arises in the quest and is quelled adds to the mind's strength, says the sage, and thus takes the seeker one step nearer to his goal. When the seeker has persisted long enough in the quest and the power from within has arisen and taken possession of the mind, the heart is quickly reached. That is to say, the mind becomes reduced to the state of pure consciousness and begins to shine steadily in its pure form as the formless I. The sage calls this formless consciousness the I am I, to distinguish it from the ego sense which has the form of I am this body, that implies the sensation of the ego form. The finite ego is swallowed up by the infinite self, with the finite ego are lost all the imperfections and limitations which beset life. Desire and fear are at an end, as well as sin and accountability. The real self was never subject to these. They belong to the ego, and they do not survive the ego. In the egoless state, the self abides in its own glory. The sage that has thus found the self, having shed the ego, is not an individual, though he may appear as such to immature disciples and to the rest of the world. The sage recommends also meditation of the pure I am or I aham as an equivalent of the quest. He says, since his name is I, the sadaka that meditates on the I is taken to the heart, the world of the real self. How to reconcile devotion to the self with the daily routine of work that the world demands? This question was put to the sage by one who had come from a distant place by rail. The sage replied as follows, Why do you think you are active? Take the case of your coming here. You left home in a cart, took your seat in a train, alighted at Tiruvannamalai station, again got into a cart and found yourself here. When asked, you say that you came here from your town. Is it true? As a matter of fact, you remained as you were. Only the conveyances moved, just as these movements are taken as yours, so also are the other activities. They are not yours. They are God's activities. The questioner objected that such an attitude will simply lead to blankness of mind 
and work will come to a standstill. The sage told him, Go up to that blankness and then tell me. From this we may understand that to the extent we realize that the self is not the doer, it is not necessary for the earnest seeker to retire from his worldly activities, to become a recluse or hermit. In order to prosecute this quest, he may just allow the mind and the senses to do their work automatically, remembering that he himself is not the doer, all the time that he may be active in the quest or in meditation just as one thinks while walking. Not only is it unnecessary to renounce one's everyday activities, to become a recluse or hermit in order to take up this quest, but it would appear, from what the sage has actually said, that it may be desirable for most of us to continue to be active in order to prepare for the quest. The sage tells us that dissolution of the mind in the self is accomplished by steadily cultivating the knowledge that the mind is but a phantom of the self, and that this can be done while going through one's everyday activities. These activities can thus be utilized as a preparation for the quest. When this knowledge that the mind is but a phantom of the real self is firmly established, then it will be easy to take the quest and persist in it watchfully to the very end. Many times the question was raised before the sage whether or not it is necessary to renounce house and family ties and fare forth as a mendicant ascetic. The sage has said that if one be fated to become an ascetic, the question will not arise, but that as a rule it is not necessary. On one occasion there was a short dialogue. The visitor asked, Should I leave home or may I remain there? The sage said, Are you in the house or is the house in you? You should remain just where you are even now. You cannot go away from that. So I may remain at home. I did not say so. Listen, you should remain steadfast just in that place, which is naturally yours always. The questioner put the question assuming that he was in the house. But the truth is that the whole world is in him as the real self. So he was told to remain in the self that is to cease to think that the world is real. On another occasion, the sage said, A householder who does not think I am a householder is a true ascetic, while an ascetic who thinks I am an ascetic is not. The self is neither an ascetic nor a householder. It may be remarked that the assumption of an ascetic mode of life is a serious affair. The sage points out that in any case, it is the mind that has to be harmonized to the quest, and if it cannot be done at home, it would be difficult equally elsewhere. A great power for good, which the disciple must utilize wherever possible, is the society of sages. The sacred lore seems to use even the language of hyperbole in recommending this. The sage cites these texts freely. The extent to which one would be benefited depends on one's understanding of and devotion to the sage as guru. Such devotion is of great importance, as we shall see in a later chapter. An important caution to the disciple is given in a minor work attributed to the sage Shankara, and this is adopted by the sage. One should inwardly reflect on the truth of non-duality always, but should not seek to apply the teaching in his actions. Meditation on non-duality is proper in respect of all the three worlds, but understand that it should not be done in respect of the guru. It may be difficult to make out the reason for these injunctions, but if we remember the power of the ego to pervert and frustrate even honest efforts to realize the truth, which would mean its own death, we need not be puzzled. Reflection on the truth of Advaita tends to dissolve the ego and develop devotion to the truth. But action from the Advaitic standpoint is suicidal because the enemy would be in charge of such action. While ignorance is alive, 
duality persists in appearing as real because of the ego sense, and truly Advaitic action is impossible. The sage alone can put Advaita into action because he is egoless. Hence the sacred lore and also the sage advise us to restrict our activities and not to extend them so as to give as little scope as possible for the ego to frustrate our efforts. Herein it will be useful to remember that a theoretical knowledge of the self does not destroy the ego, the enemy within us. Devotion to the Guru as God incarnate is proper and necessary, as we shall see later. Until one becomes egoless, therefore, it would be unwise to try to look upon the Guru as oneself, because the actual result will be something quite different. It will result in believing oneself to be the equal of the Guru. To be really one with the Guru is to be egoless. Hence the caution not to imagine non-difference with the Guru. The following cautions and instructions are from the Guru Ramana Vachana Mala Sarikachara Prakarana. Forgetting the self is verily death. Therefore, for him that is out to conquer death by the quest, the one rule to fulfill is not to forget. Since even one's activities are a cause of forgetting the self, it is necessary to say that he that is engaged in the quest of the self should not engage in the work of other people. Though there are numerous observances, the rule of regulated eating is alone sufficient for the sadaka seeker because it augments the sattva quality. The rule of food regulation is that one should allow time for the stomach's rest, and when hungry, eat a limited amount of sattvika food the sadhaka, until the ego dies finally. Humility alone is good for the sadhaka. He should never accept homage done to him by others. The pot sinks because it takes in water. Timber floats because it does not. He that is attached becomes bound. He that is not is not bound, even if he is in the house. One should overcome misfortunes with faith courage and serenity, remembering that they come by God's grace in order to give strength. For one that is devoted to the highest, it is better to be in a worldly condition to be pitied by men than in one that would cause envy, indifference all around, with a mind serene, without desire and without hate, is the beautiful way of life for sadhakas. What is called fate is nothing but actions done by oneself before. Hence, fate can be wiped off by suitable effort. What is done with peaceful and pure mind is righteous action. Whatever is done with the mind agitated and from desire is wrong action. To be unattached and at peace, resigning all burden to God the Almighty, is the highest tapas. As the grains that remain at the base of the pivot in a hand mill are not crushed, so those that have taken refuge in God are unaffected even by great misfortunes. As the magnetic needle swerves not from the north, so those that have their minds devoted to God do not swerve from the right path through illusion. Never give ways to anxiety, thinking, When shall I attain this state? It is beyond space and time, and therefore is neither far nor near. Pervading everything by its own nature, the self is ever free. How can it be bound by maya? So do not give way to despair. The notion, I am an unstable soul, has arisen by letting go one's immovable nature. The sadhakas should cast off this notion and rest in the supreme silence. This is the device for overcoming the capricious nature of the mind. Look upon all that is perceived and on the perceiver as the real self. As a thorn that is used for taking out a thorn should be thrown aside, so a good thought that is useful for driving out an evil thought 
should also be given up. As one dives into the sea with a heavy stone and takes out pearls, so one should dive with non-attachment into the heart and gain the self. The quest of the real self is fundamentally different from all methods of winning deliverance which are in vogue. These are known as yogas. Four of them are generally known, namely the yogas of action, of devotion, of mind control, and of right understanding. The sage compares these four with the quest in the following. The quest, who is he? To whom belong actions, separateness from God, ignorance or separateness from reality? Is itself the yogas of action, of devotion, of right understanding, and of mind control? That is the true state of the self, the untainted and blissful experience of one's own self. With a seeker, the I being extinct, these eight have no place. Here is made clear that in the four yogas, the follower takes the ego to be himself, and thus attributes to the self some one or other of the defects that appear in himself because of the conclusion. The yogi of action takes it that the self is the doer of action and is thus bound to suffer their effects. He wants to neutralize these actions by other actions. The yogi of devotion is persuaded that he is other than God and needs to become united to him by devotion. The yogi of right understanding thinks that the self is in ignorance and wants to remove that ignorance. The yogi of mind control thinks that the self is separated from the reality and seeks reunion by mind control. These are wrong assumptions, because there is no individual soul, because the whole world order is an illusion. When the real self is sought and found, it will be found that that self was never bound, but is ever perfect. The seeker of the self starts with this knowledge. When by the quest the ego dies, it will be seen that neither these four defects nor the four remedies for them have any place in the egoless state, which alone is real. The sage once told this writer that the quest is the great yoga, the maha yoga, and the reason is that, as shown here, all the yogas are included in the quest. Chapter 10. The Sage Perhaps the most difficult subject in this inquiry is the sage. He is both beyond and, though only seemingly, within relativity at the same time. He is thus in two mutually contradictory states at the same time, for relativity and the real are negations of each other. This is the root of the perplexity that besets the ideas of disciples on this subject. The textbooks mention two kinds of deliverance. The living sage is said to have one kind of deliverance. When his body dies, there is another kind of it. The former is called Jivan Mukti, deliverance in life. The sage that has it is called Ejivan Mukta. The latter is called Bideha Mukti, bodiless deliverance. The sage tells us that there is only one kind of deliverance, namely egolessness. Since the world has no existence without the ego, it follows that the sage is bodiless, in fact, whatever he may seem to be. Even those that think that the sage has a body and mind are unable to realize that they are unreal, can understand this much, that this causal body, which is the primary ignorance, has been dissolved, and that therefore the sage, who is just the real self and nothing else, is in no way connected with the surviving subtle and gross bodies as the ignorant one thinks himself to be. For the sage, therefore, nothing exists except the self. There is neither body, nor mind, nor world, nor other persons. In speaking of the sage, therefore, we need to keep distinct the two points of view, the point of view of the semi-ignorant disciple and that of the sage himself. The sage himself has repeatedly emphasized that for him there is no problem at all, no need of reconciling inconsistencies. From his point of view, 
all the three bodies are non-existent. Not only that, he does not even recognize that they existed before. Hence, it is only as a concession to the semi-ignorant disciple that the distinction is mentioned in the books. The absolute truth of deliverance is that it is bodiless and worldless, because deliverance is the state where the truth alone shines. The Jivan Mukta is therefore not a person, but because of the dual role stated before. Personality is attributed to him. In the Upanishadic lore, this point of view is tolerated, and it is said that his body will be subject to the law of causality while it survives. By the force of this law, his body will be affected by the reactions, pleasant or unpleasant, of previous actions, which are called karmas. These are divided into three parts or lots. There is the particular lot of karmas which came to fruition at birth, which gave the sage the present body, and will go on regulating what happens to it till it dies. This karma is called prarabdha, because it has begun to yield fruit. There is another lot of karma called agami, actions to come. The remainder is called sanchita, the reserve. This is an enormous lot, because of the great number of the past lives that have been lived. It is said that the first lot alone retains its power, but that the second and third lots become liquidated when one becomes a sage, when individuality is lost. The sage will have no more rebirths, nor will he go to other worlds, but he will reap the fruits of the prarabdha, or current karma. So says the ancient lore in some places. We shall see that this is not strictly correct. We have seen before that the sage is in the natural state, or sahaja samadhi, always. This is not, as we have seen, the kevala nirvikalpa samadhi of the yogi, which is inconstant. This natural state is not inimical to the automatic bodily activities which are attributed to the sage. So it may be said, in a sense, that the sage is awake to the self and to the world also. He seems to eat, sleep, and live like other persons. Because he is in the sahaja, he is able to hear and answer questions. The yogi that is sometimes in trance and sometimes awake cannot give us any such teaching because he himself is still in bondage and ignorance. If there were no sahaja state, then it would happen that whoever obtains direct and perfect experience of the self would at once cease to appear with the body in this world, and thus there would never be anyone who would impart authentic teaching about the self and the method of finding him. But the sahaja state exists and is attained by some rare seeker now and then. Thus the teaching of the sacred lore is confirmed and corrected, added to where necessary, and made intelligible to qualified disciples by an, by an unbroken line of sages. Within historical times, there were the sages Gautama and Shankara. How many others there were, we do not know. This office is now fulfilled by the sage Ramana. Those that have not heard and understood the truth of the natural state, namely, that it is not inimical, like the Kevala, to bodily activity, raise a question about the sage, the answer to which is not easy to understand for all. Even among the sage's disciples, there are some who cannot understand the answer. But that is so because they are believers in a fascinating but complicated creed in which the chief tenet is that the world is real as such. It is therefore quite natural that they should refuse to understand the sage's teachings, of which the essential part is that the world is not real as such. They are dualist, in fact, and as such, violent haters of Advaitic teaching. In this connection we may take note of the tenderness the sage shows for the weaknesses of believers. The sage observes the rule enunciated in the Gita that no one's faith should be disturbed. 
Therefore, when ardent duelists are present, the sage is very careful in what he says. He does not, while they are present, give out clear Advaitic teaching. But as soon as the duelist goes out, he turns round to the Advaitists that remain and apologetically explains to them that he had to water down the teaching to suit the duelist. He thus treats the latter as immature ones and the Advaitists as adults who can understand that allowances have to be made to the immature. But he leaves us in no doubt at all that the Advaitic teaching is the highest there can be. We have two kinds of views about the sage. First, there is the view that is held by those who claim to be Advaitists, but who have not sat at the feet of the sage. Then there is the view held by disciples of the sage or hostile to his Advaitic teaching. The former class of people argue thus. The person called Ramana Maharshi lives in the world very much like other people. He eats, sleeps, acts, talks, and does other things. He remembers the past and answers questions about it. Therefore, he has both ego and mind. Also, he says, I, you, and he, just as we do. Therefore, he is not a Jivan Mukta, though we are willing to allow that he is a holy person. We need have no quarrel with these people. It is clear that they imagine the Kevala Nirvikalpa to be the final state. Hence, they are unable to understand how a sage can live among men as a light from the real self. To be able to recognize a sage, one must be a genuine devotee of the real self. This implies a refinement of understanding, a humbleness of spirit and other virtues. For such a one, the sage has a real and abiding attraction. On the other hand, those that are in love with bondage, even though they are learned in the sacred lore, are not so attracted. They are prosperous in a worldly sense and think themselves happy. And they are perhaps afraid that if they go to the sage, he might affect a change in their outlook of the consequences of which they are sincerely afraid. Being so afraid, they keep at a safe distance from the sage. But those that have been attracted to the sage, having felt keenly the need of a competent guru, are able to see that he is something unique. They may take time to understand that he is a sage. That is because they need first to understand what a sage is and what are the unfailing marks of one. The one unfailing mark is the non-perception of difference. Now we shall consider the other view, that which is upheld by certain sectarian devotees of the sage. They say that he is a sage, but they also maintain that he is a person. They say that he is an exalted person. They hold it as an article of belief that personality is real and that it persists in deliverance, though inconsistently enough, they admit that the ego is lost in deliverance. The sage, they say, has a mind and therefore has a distinct existence. They say that in deliverance, the mind is changed into something wonderful and becomes endowed with divine powers of Siddhis. To these powers, they attach a profound importance. They seem to think that it is these powers that prove him to be a sage. We have seen in the chapter on God that the essential teaching of the sage is the truth of non-becoming, which means that the reality never actually became the three, these being merely creations of the ego mind, which is itself unreal. In other words, the sage is at one with the sage Shankara in saying that this is all Maya. He explains that deliverance consists in the reduction to the nothingness of what is always nothing. The threefold false appearance is unreal even now, but appears as real through ignorance. That appearance will cease in such a way that it could not even be said that it appeared before and cease to appear later. This is made clear by the following utterance of the sage, which tells us what is accomplished by the Guru's grace. Reducing the unreal to reality and causing the one real self to shine, the Guru puts a final end to the unreal soul. The sectarian views under discussion 
are certainly not reconcilable with these teachings. We have seen that the Siddhis, which loom large in the eyes of these disciples, are unreal, being part of the world illusion, which is the substance of bondage. It is therefore ridiculous, as the sage points out, to seek to appraise the greatness of a sage by the Siddhis that seem to be manifested in his presence. The rejection of the truth of non-becoming has led these disciples to misunderstand the sage. One such misunderstanding is pointed out and corrected by the sage in the following. Ignorant people say the sage sees differences, but enjoys non-difference in them. This non-perception of differences is twofold. As non-perception of difference between oneself and others and non-perception of difference among others, the former is manifested by the sage's indifference to praise and censure. The latter is seen in what is termed the equal eye, which is referred to in the famous but much misunderstood verse of the Gita, where it is said that sages look with equal eye on all creatures. The former quality is, as we have seen in the first chapter, peculiar to the sage. No one that is not perfectly egoless is naturally unaffected by praise and censure, as is indicated by the verse cited on page 17. There is a historical anecdote connected with this verse, which is told of a sage of the recent past, and we must presume that the incident took place before he attained sagehood. The Holy One had renounced the world at an early age and was wandering in the forest practicing samadhi for the sake of deliverance. Once a co-pupil of his met him somewhere and warmly praised him to his face. The Holy One was visibly elated and this was noticed by the other. It was a surprise to him that such a Holy One could be moved by praise. He had once expressed what he thought. The Holy One replied by uttering the verse cited above. The meaning of it is this. It is next to impossible for one to cast off subjection to the harlot praise, even though he has renounced the world as trash and mastered the secrets of the sacred lore. While even a trace of egoism remains, the hearing of praise or censure will automatically cause a scent of pleasure or pain. The egoless one is not moved by these. He does not feel pleasure or pain from praise or blame, as is expressed by the sage in the following. To one who is firmly established in the blissful, natural state beyond change, and therefore is not aware of difference, who does not think I am one and he is another, who is there other than the self? If anyone says anything about him, what matters it? For him it is just the same as if it was said by himself. Non-perception of difference among others, which is called equality of vision, is equally a peculiar feature of the sage. We have noticed that the sage does not recognize distinctions, whether natural or man-made. This is what the sage says about it. The equal vision of the sage is just the recognition that the one self, who is consciousness, is present in all that appears. In other words, it is egolessness. The same is the meaning of the grossly misunderstood and misapplied text of the Gita, where it is said that the sage looks with equal eye on all creatures. This equal eye is not for the ego-ridden ones, because they do not see the real self in all. Equal vision does not consist in acting as if all human beings are equal as such. Not equality, but unity is the teaching, and that can be realized only by oneself becoming egoless. In this connection, we may remember the caution against applying the teaching of non-difference in action. This truth about the sage, namely his non-perception of difference, is sometimes erroneously described as perception of non-difference in difference. This description is favored by some of his sectarian disciples. They say that the sage sees difference in non-difference and enjoys non-difference in difference. This description is picturesque, but contrary to the truth of non-becoming, 
which has been set before. On this point the sage says, It is wrongly said by the ignorant that the sage sees difference, but enjoys non-difference in them. The truth is that he does not see difference at all. Besides, the primary difference is that between subject and object, and in the state of non-difference, namely the egoless state, this difference does not survive. Hence, perception is impossible in that state. It is therefore absurd to describe the sage as perceiving non-difference. He can be rightly described only as non-perceiving difference. Perhaps what these sectarians mean is that the sage knows the underlying unity while seeing the differences. If so, then we have to ask whether this knowledge of the unity is experimental or merely inferential. This revelation makes it clear to us that so long as differences are being perceived, that is, so long as the ego survives, only inferential or theoretical knowledge of the unity is possible, not experience. This means that the sage has no experience of the unity, which is absurd. An argument advanced by these sectarians is that there must be something to maintain the distinction between one sage and another. They here take it for granted there is a distinction, and to account for it, they claim that each sage has a subtle body of his own. We have seen that the subtle body is not other than the ego, and that the latter is just a hyphen joining two mutually negatory things, the real self and the body. It logically follows from this that there is no distinction between sage and sage, and this is true because the sage is not the knower or enjoyer of the self, but utterly identical with the self. This is what sage Sri Ramana says on this point. It is from ignorance that you say, I have seen this sage, I shall see that other sage also. If you know by experience the sage that is within you, then all sages will be seen to be one. It may be said that we do see a body and mind belonging to the sage, but so do we see other bodies and minds, and the teaching is that they are unreal. The truth is that it is our mind that creates the sage's mind and body, just as it creates the whole world, including God. We see the sage as a person in our dream of relativity, occurring in the sleep of ignorance. In the Guru Ramana Vachana Mala, we are told, the body or mind that appears as pertaining to the sage, who is in truth intangible like the sky, is just a reflection of the body or mind of him that sees it. It is not real. Whatever may be the case of other men, disciples ought not, we are told, to entertain the notion that the sage is embodied. In the same book it is said, Understand that he that regards as really embodied the sage, his guru, who appears like a human being, but who is really infinite consciousness, is sinful and of impure mind. The immature disciple cannot help making the mistake here pointed out. And there is some excuse for him because he may plausibly argue that only the causal body of the sage is dissolved, but that the other two bodies survive but he must outgrow this tentative point of view. How can he himself attain absolute bodilessness as pure spirit if he regards his guru as not having attained that state? We have to recognize, therefore, that though the sage appears to us behaving like a person in the world, he is in fact the pure consciousness, which cannot even be described as the witness of the activities of the mind and the body. A question was put to the sage. Does the sage see the world as others do? The sage replied, The question does not arise for the sage, but only for the ignorant. He puts the question because of his ego. To him, the answer is, Find out the truth of him to whom the question occurs. You ask the question because you see the sage active like other men. The fact is the sage does not see the world as others do. Take for an illustration, the cinema. There are pictures moving on the screen. 
If one goes up to them and tries to seize them, he seizes only the screen. And when the pictures disappear, the screen alone remains. Such is the case with the sage. The same question is answered by the sage also as follows. The world is real, both to the ignorant and to the sage. The ignorant one believes the real to be coextensive with the world. The sage, the real, is the formless one, the basic substance on which the world appears. Thus great indeed is the difference between the sage and the ignorant one. Here the sage begins by saying that superficially considered, the ignorant one and the sage are alike, for they both say that the world is real. But it is here pointed out that what the sage means by the words is quite the opposite of what the other means. The ignorant man takes the world to be real as such, with all its variety of name and form, and has no idea of the basic reality which, as shown before, is like gold to the jewels made of it, is the substance that is real as opposed to the forms that are unreal. The sage rejects the unreal part of the world and takes as real only the substratum, the formless pure consciousness, the self, which is unaffected by the false appearances. The self is real, says the sage, not the world, because he exists alone in his state of purity as the pure consciousness without the world. The world cannot exist without the self. Thus, we have to conclude that the sage does not see the world and has no part or lot in it. What seem to us to be his activities are not therefore really his. Being egoless and mindless, he does not will those actions. The same power by which the activities of all creatures are prompted and sustained is behind those of the sage also, with this difference that while the ignorant think they themselves are the doers, the sage does not think so. He acts automatically as a sleepy child eats, when roused and fed by his mother. If agency has to be ascribed to somebody, let it rather be ascribed to God than to the sage. Because while God is in one point of view the regulator of the world, the sage has nothing to do with the world. In truth, that is, in the egoless state, both are identical. Neither is an agent, because neither is other than the real self, which is one. The real self is never an agent. Agency is ascribed to him only through ignorance. The sage we saw is the self in his utter purity, as unvariegated consciousness. Hence, he is never an agent. This is brought out in the following. If the self were ever himself the doer, then he himself would reap the fruits of actions. But since the sense of doership is lost on the experience of the infinite self by the quest, who am I that is the doer? With it will be lost the three kinds of actions. The wise knows this state as timeless deliverance. From this, incidentally, we learn that deliverance is perfect and absolute, not qualified as might appear from some of the Upanishadic texts. These tell us that a portion of the karma of him who has attained sagehood remains unaffected and will be exhausted only when his body dies. This karma is the parabdha or current karma, that which came to fruition at birth, which gave him the body, and will regulate all that happens to it till its death. We are to understand that the liability to reap the fruits of this karma is only apparent, not real. The sage emphasizes this in the following. What is said in the books, namely that the actions of the future and those of the reserve, belonging to the sage, are certainly lost, but that the current karma is not lost is intended for the ignorant. But just as one wife out of many cannot remain sumangali, non-widow, on the death of the husband, so all the three divisions of karma are lost, when the doer, the ego, is lost. I am doer is a thought. It cannot survive the ego. That the sage is in his real nature mindless and does not will the actions he seems to do will be seen from the following. 
Once the sage was going about somewhere on Arunachala Hill, when he accidentally disturbed a hive of a community of wasps hidden by the dense foliage of a shrub, the wasp got angry and settled upon the offending leg and went on stinging. The sage stayed there motionless till the wasp were satisfied, saying to the leg, Take the consequences of your action. This incident was narrated by the sage to many disciples, and so it was known to all. Long afterwards, a sage devotee put him the following question. Since the disturbance of the wasp eye was accidental, why should it be regretted and atoned for as if it had been done intentionally? The sage replied, If in fact the regretting and atoning is not his act, what must be the true nature of his mind? Here the sage met the question by another question. The disciple knew his guru to be a sage, but it seems that at the time he was not fully aware of the truth that a sage is one who is a native of the egoless state and is therefore mindless. Hence he assumed that the act in question was done by the sage and based his question on that assumption. The sage graciously pointed out that the assumption was wrong and indicated that the so-called mind of a sage is not really mind, but pure consciousness. The sage has confirmed this teaching many times, saying that the mind of a sage is not mind, but the supreme reality. Since the sage is mindless, he is in no way related to the world and its affairs. That is the essence of his being free. He does not feel obliged to do certain things, or not to do certain other things. Whatever he does, he does spontaneously and automatically, without forethought, as one would do that has no mind. The ancient lore tells us that the sage is not assailed by regrets. I have done wrong or I have not done right. The sage expresses the same truth as follows. Can the sage that dwells in the state of unity with the truth which arises by consuming the ego, and is calm, happy, and beyond relativity, and is therefore wantless, be bound to do anything whatever in the world? Since he is unaware of anything other than the self, how can his state, which is mindless, be conceived by the mind? Thus, we have to conclude that for him the words duty and its correlative, right, are meaningless. Of course, Having a divine mission to fulfill, to illumine and uplift those that are ripe for deliverance, he is not inactive. He does not will the actions he does. In fact, his activity is far more efficient because of its egolessness than it would be if he willed them. The sacred lore and the sage tell us that the sage is a non-doer and great-doer at the same time. There is no contradiction in this because he is a not-doer in truth, but appears to be greatly active to those who see him. He cannot be really active because if he were, he would be aware of persons different from the self. And we have been clearly told this is not the case. Actions are willed out of desire. He is desirelessless, aptakama, because he is happy in the self, atmarama, on one occasion, the sage was asked whether it was not his duty to preach the truth to all the people and thus make them free. He answered, If a man awakes from a dream, does he ask, Have those men that I saw in the dream awakened? Just so, the sage is not concerned about the people of the world. Referring to the notion, now fashionable, that it would be selfish to attain freedom for oneself, leaving all the world in bondage, he said, this is like a dreamer saying, I shall not awake till all these dream men awake. A cryptic saying of the sage is as follows. The egoless state is not one of indolence, but of the intensest activity. This seems to be in conflict with another description by the sage himself, where it is said that it is the sleep of bliss. We may remember that in a passage cited before, the sage describes the state as waking sleep. This means that both the above descriptions are true and mean the same thing. The sleep aspect concerns the world of illusion. 
to that the sage is asleep. This is brought out in the following. Just as to the one that is asleep in a carriage, its three states, namely its movement, its standing still, and its being left with the horses unyoked are all alike. So to the sage that is in the sleep of self-awareness in the carriage, the body, the three states of it, namely bodily activity, samadhi sleep, are alike. Here the parallels between the sage and the sleeper should be noted. The body is compared to the carriage and the sense organs to the horses. Hence, waking activities are like the movements of the carriage. The states of samadhi and sleep are both states of rest. But the former is compared to the standing still of the carriage with the horses still yoked, because in samadhi, the senses are not detached. Hence, says the sage, in samadhi, the head does not bend, but remains upright. In sleep, the senses are detached, and hence, the head bends if the sleeper is sitting. Thus, outwardly, there are differences, but inwardly there is no difference. The above comparison to the sleeper in a carriage is given only to show that the changes of bodily condition and hence of the world as a whole do not affect the sage. It is not to be assumed that the sage is in unconsciousness as in sleep. This we shall see presently. The truth of the sage's condition is brought out in the Gita verse previously cited, where it is contrasted with that of the man in ignorance, where it is said that what is night to all creatures is day to the sage, while what is day to them is night to the sage, who, however, is wide awake. The cryptic saying of the sage that the state is one of intense activity will now become intelligible. The sage is awake in and as the real self who is consciousness. But consciousness can never become unconscious. Hence, he can never sleep. That is his activity. And that is all the activity there is. All else is maya. The sage is not asleep, even when the body sleeps. May be inferred from the observed fact that the sage is always alert, ready for any kind of activity. This is because the sage is ever in the natural state, which is neither trance nor the waking state of the ignorant. We have seen already that only a sage can be a guru, because he alone can work both from within and from without. The true guru, it is said, pushes the disciple's mind inside from without and pulls it in from within, and thus gives him that experience of the self which will make him free. For this work of grace to be accomplished, the disciple must practice devotion to the sage as God. It is said, He that meditates on the nature of the sage, who dwells in the heart, mindless as the blessed one, the self of all, obtains the experience of the self.